Um, I hope um, everybody is having a good day so far, morning or afternoon, depending where you're coming from. I think we'll go ahead and get started right on time while um, the rest of our attendees are, are kind of trickling in. I'm going to give a little um, a little introduction here. Um, welcome to the Greening Local Government uh, third Thursday webinar series. My name is Myla Kelly. I'm the coordinator of the Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Center. Um, our center is um, is coordinating and facilitating this series, and I'm pleased to have you all here and taking time out of your busy schedules to, to be with us today. Um, it's really been a, an exciting process to be able to highlight some of the wonderful work that our local governments are doing around the region, and, um, and I'm pleased to be able to do that today. And, and also in the past, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, some of the programs that we featured so far, and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, how you can find us and, and find some other recordings and case studies on the Greening Local Government website. And then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our, um, our guest presenter for the day. So today, um, as I mentioned, um, we are, I'm the coordinator of the Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Information Center, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, we are located at Montana State University in Bozeman, um, in Montana. Uh, we are part of the, um, the extension program at MSU. Um, and within extension, we're part of the Housing and Environmental Health Department. Um, we are funded by, uh, by EPA to do pollution prevention outreach. So basically, we work with um, citizens, small business, and local governments around EPA's Region 8, which is North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. I think I got everybody. Um, we work with different audiences around the region to provide access to current information, um, contacts, encourage collaboration, leverage resources between programs that are working to um, prevent pollution, which basically can come in a lot of different forms. Um, pollution prevention basically just means um, kind of solving a solving a problem, what could potentially become a problem at the outset rather than dealing with it um, at the end. So we were often worked with schools on um, uh, um, implementing green cleaning programs within the schools, and um, we're, and right now we're working on this uh, greening local government webinar series. So we also coordinate the national tribal pollution prevention network, which you can find out about at tribalp2.org. And the third initiative that we work on is called the Economy, Energy, and Environment Initiative for Montana Agriculture, and that's an initiative to identify energy efficiency opportunities on agricultural land in Montana. Right now, currently, we're just working on that in Montana. Um, so uh, we have put together, in conjunction with the development of our greeninglocalgovernment.org website, we've put together this webinar series that's designed for local governments um, to highlight case studies from communities that are working towards resource efficiency, energy conservation, and economic savings. Um, as funding from this project came from an EPA Region 8 grant, our case studies do come from states within that geographic uh, region, but the webinar series, as you guys know, is free and open open to local governments and um, whomever would like to participate um, across the nation. So we've had a few webinars so far. We heard, um, uh, I think it was the first one, January 9th, we heard from, um, January 16th, we heard from Missoula County, Montana and El Paso County, Colorado on their efforts to collect household hazardous waste and other toxic trash and keep that out of their landfill. Um, and then we heard um, in February about some energy efficiency programs um, that some um, that some local governments were doing and um, and now we we skipped March due to some conflicting issues and here we are in April and we're going to hear about some rural transportation issues um, all of these webinars are recorded and the presentations and the recordings um, are can be found at the website um, greenlocalgovernment.org and also on that website you can find a wealth of information about these topics, um, other resources that you can go to and look at um, regarding these topic areas. Um, this is our contact information, and I just wanted to um, to give you a heads up for, with our web webinar logistics here. We have. Um, 
uh, I don't know how many of you have participated in, in webinars before, but um, the way it works is that all of the attendee lines are muted just by default. So we can't hear you at all, just to minimize the background noise. But we do encourage your participation. And the best way to do that is through um, typing in questions through the, um, the question pane, which you should see on your little webinar dashboard. Um, you can type a question directly into there, and then I'll field those questions for, for our presenter. Um, and let's see, what else did I want to say? I think that was it. Um, I think without um, further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our um, our speakers for the day today. We I'm really really happy to um, to be able to introduce Opportunity Link. Um, they're a group um, in the northern north central part of of Montana. Um, one of their projects that they're working on is this rural transportation project, which is really really um, very innovative, and it looks to be um, I think it's got some years under its belt. And so um, it's exciting to see that um, we are going to be hearing from Jim Lyons who's Opportunity Link's Director of Transportation. Um, Jim oversees the management of the North Central Montana Transit System since it was established in, in 2009. Um, the North Central the North Central Montana Transit System is a public transportation system that's operated by Opportunity Link, and it was designed to serve the Highline residents of Hill County, Blaine County, surrounding communities, which, as you'll see in Jim's presentation, is a massive area. Um, it was designed to serve those communities um, um, for um, their transportation needs. So Opportunity Link was designated as the lead agency for this system in a partnership between local government, social services, um, academic, and other area agencies. Starting in December of 2010, Jim also took on the management of the Haver Hill County Airport, and he has 30 years of transportation experience with an emphasis in the area of scheduling, industrial engineering, and operations. He has worked with both Class 1 and regional rail carriers and public transportation providers. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and have Jim um, start his presentation. Just give me a second. I'm going to switch over to um, Jim's presentation here, and hopefully that will go smoothly. <laughs> you never know with these. OK. There it is. And um, Jim, take it away. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you can all hear me OK, and there's not a whole bunch of feedback. Uh, but uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, rural transportation planning and what we've done up here on the highland with North Central Montana Transit. Um, it's been quite an experience up here. Um, I'm a Montana boy, uh, familiar with the highland from a railroad standpoint, but uh, from a public transportation standpoint, it's been a completely different uh, story and a great learning experience. Um, the first slide that you see is, is the area that um, we cover as far as Opportunity Link. It's a very, very large I like, it says rural transportation, but the majority of what we are, the areas that we run are actually frontier uh, in terms of their population designations. So we run through some very, very remote, very, very desolate areas uh, to provide services to people to get them into the uh, locations where they need to be for jobs, education, etc. Can we do the next slide, please? Uh, I think this is kind of a telltale sign when you look at this particular slide. Um, as, as far as how large the area is uh, that, uh, that that we do serve with the various transportation companies that uh, uh, have been spawned by Opportunity Link in the planning uh, in the planning efforts. Um, if you look at Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, all fit very nicely within that area. You can see that man, we we run a lot of miles uh, through a lot of very difficult um, areas and through a lot of weather uh, conditions, both 105 above or 43 below. And um, if you're from the state of Montana, or I guess if you're from anywhere in the United States this year, this, this has been a very challenging winter in terms of operating conditions. But uh, uh, with proper planning and proper uh, maintenance of vehicles, et cetera, we, uh, we, we made it through very not shiningly. Um, what, there's, there's the old saying that, uh, that a picture is worth a thousand words. We've created a series of videos, uh, four to be exact, two of which you'll see today. Uh, and the first video that we really want to watch, it's, it's called We Ride the Line. And again, if a picture's worth a thousand words, the video is worth uh, so much more. And this, this video so defines us. So if uh, you guys want to watch this, we'll uh, um, enjoy it, and we'll go from there.
It's very beautiful, but very, very, very remote. Very few people inhabit the area. Daily, we, we being North Central Montana Transit, uh, travel an area about the size of the state of Maryland. The size of it is uh, immense. Rural or frontier Montana or rural frontier communities have different challenges and different needs. The main challenge I think that we face here is distance. And it's because we have very low population density that transportation is even more important. We need to keep schools open. We need to keep hospitals open in our rural areas. We need to create jobs. Well, how do you do that? You need transportation. Transportation here is a huge challenge. If you don't have transportation, you don't have access to the basic necessities of life. You can't buy food, medical care, you can't go to school. It's just an essential part of life. Why shouldn't we have a community that is livable? Why shouldn't we have access to those services that are readily available in the larger metropolitan areas? The North Central Montana Transit System was launched in August of 2009. It was predicted that the bus line would see a couple hundred riders each month, but in the 200 days the line has been in operation, they've seen over 13,000 riders. You know, even the sizes of the bus that we ordered originally, 17 passenger. The first day of operation, we exceeded that. By the second week, we were scrambling trying to find a large enough passenger bus so that we could make one of our runs because we had 20 some people standing at the bus stop on a daily basis. And thank goodness they didn't lose faith in us and they, you know, started thinking this could be a good thing. We never thought that it would take off like it did. North Central Montana Transit System has been wildly successful. People are able to uh, make their medical appointments and elderly, some of them are not able to drive or get someone to help them get to another community. On our very first day, August 24, 2009, I was getting ready for the event that we were going to have to launch the transit and I received a phone call from a lady who said that she was from out in the far reaches of Fort Belknap and she was crying because she had needed dental work and the dental surgeon that she needed to go to was in Great Falls and she said that she would needed it for several years and she could find a connection from Fort Belknap to Haver but that she had a terrible time being able to afford a connection from Haver on into Great Falls and it was hard to understand her because she said that her mouth was in such bad shape, she'd been so sick. But she was able to go have dental work because of the transit. There's many stories like that. To have this type of service available to us uh, raises our standard of living. Um, and you're able to make more connections with other communities and people. It's been a good thing. You have local and tribal governments at the table. You have economic development organizations at the table. You have poverty reduction groups at the table. You have the university system at the table. You have um, physicians and the hospital at the table. And so um, in a very real way, it does take a village to make these type of things happen. They don't just happen overnight. What North Central Montana Transit has done an excellent job at is bringing everybody to the table. Without those partnerships, this wouldn't be the success that it has been. This matters. It makes a difference in the lives of people who live in a place that oftentimes has been left out of the national economic scene. The transit systems, particularly in rural areas throughout this country, um, don't bankroll themselves. And so we, we need forward-thinking, progressive, policymakers at both the state and federal level to understand that investing in public transit systems in rural areas is truly an investment versus a cost or an expense and that as we move forward I would hope that those policymakers would make the right decision and invest wisely in public transit for rural areas.
what futures can we impact with NCMT? I'm more of a person that wants to reflect on growing our communities, growing those assets, making sure that barriers that people encounter in order to improve their lives or to make their lives more vibrant. If we focus on that, then we're bound to improve a lot of futures. It's amazing that one thing as simple as a ride can change a person's life. Uh, North Central Montana Transit uh, has been now running since 2009. And how we kind of got there, I don't know um, how we got to where we're at we're, with the startup of uh, um, uh, North Central Montana Transit in 2009 was due to a lot of work that was done ahead of time with uh, by Opportunity Link. You know, Opportunity Link is, is a nonprofit organization that uh, was established in the year 2004. Um, by communities across the High Line and throughout North Central uh, Montana. And it was funded by the Northwest Area Foundation. Again, if you go back to the map, you see that you know, we have we're comprised of 11 counties and three, under, three Indian reservations, the Blackfeet, Fort Belknap, and Rocky Boy. And you know, through the planning process uh, with Opportunity Link, one of the first things that was identified, one of the key strategies for building prosperity in this remote area was transportation. Uh, when you're in these, these very, very isolated communities, um, without transportation you don't get to your basic services such as health care, employment, um, education, and you know just the opportunity to have a better quality of life. And so the transportation process, the regional transportation process started in the year 2006. And OL, Opportunity Link, facilitated the development of the transportation and gave the options to the communities uh, to implement and coordinate their implement, uh, coordinated the implementation for them. Um, they have used the you know models for implementation. They established North Transit Interlocal in 2008, and that was a partnership between two counties and three towns in the western part of the regions. Uh, Fort Belknap, uh, which reservation system for Belknap transportation system, uh, was established in March of 2009. And then we were established, we being North Central Montana Transit, started in 2009, August 2009. And we're a partnership between three cities, um, I use the word, word loosely, two counties and uh, uh, two tribal governments. Um, and it's with several, several of the community businesses, et cetera, involved and also educational organizations within uh, uh, our, our, our area. Um, the partners have requested that Opportunity Link uh, manage the system, and uh, we are still running the system. Uh, with Opportunity Link being the um, the, the umbrella organization, uh, we also Rocky Boy Transit, which is on Chippewa Cree Tribe uh, Indian Reservation, was established in 2009, and also Tool County 2010 and Glacier County 2011. So you can tell that OL has been involved in a number of these regional startups and these. Uh, um, on this, uh, with these rural transportation entities. Um, one of the things that we've learned through this process, and it's been very, very important, is to keep our role as a just being a neutral conveyor. Um, by doing that, we could help facilitate the meetings, the partnerships, uh, whenever needed. And we're also able to make sure that everyone's represented uh, during the planning processes. Uh, Opportunity Link allowed the communities and partners to take uh, to the table to take ownership and to provide leadership for the process, uh, for their own projects. Um, we felt it was our role to provide information, technical assistance whenever it was needed to help inform them uh, of the planning processes and implementation processes. And you know, since we weren't experts, we also had an opportunity to bring in the Western, Trans Western Transportation Institute of Montana State University, uh, which did a wonderful job as far as uh, helping facilitate planning process and bringing in the expertise. You know, we've had a lot of projects that we've done. Um, if you look at the, uh, the slide that's up there right now, we have the Regional Public Transportation System established six new rural transit systems 
north central Montana, the ones that we mentioned, the north, northern transit interlocal, Fort Belknap transportation system, north central Montana transit, etc. And we also had the homegrown strategy approach to regional transportation. And that's working with the communities to develop that regional transportation plan and to best serve the communities, what their transportation needs are, the listening, the sitting down with all entities to decide uh, you know, what the system was going to look at or look like, who is it going to serve, where the stops are going to be, facilitated in planning, and again, back to the neutral conveyor to ensure inclusive multi-jurisdictional participation. Horizontal network approach to collaboration and leadership, and we also provided, again, that technical leadership for West Transportation Institute where it was needed. Um, if you, you know, going back to that first thing, one of the, the first video that we watched, one of the interesting things, one of the, as I saw that again, uh, the gentleman who's painting the sign, uh, as you saw, identifying the system, the outline of the system, that gentleman, his name's Brad Shields, and he joined us as a writer in 2009, and he did provide us with that wonderful picture that he did, but we're happy to say that we'll be attending his, attending his graduation this May from uh, Montana State Northern University, where he has a degree in draft, will be receiving his bachelor's in uh, graphic design. So. Uh, that individual by himself is one of, uh, uh, one of the ones I look at and I see him and I think, man, he, he started long, started with us a long time ago and he's done so very well to get to where he's at now. So we're proud to have uh, Brad do the sign and proud of where he's at. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, the, the next slide is North Central Montana Transit ourselves. If you, uh, this is the system that I have the responsibility for. We're a fixed route system, um, so we are not on on-demand. Uh, we run a fixed route system. So all of our stops are um, at locations where people can get out of the weather, etc. Uh, but we do run a fixed stop or a fixed route system, which is a schedule. Uh, the schedules that we produce are, um, and we're very good at what we do and how we run the schedule. A large number of our riderships depend upon us to get them to school on time, a large number to get work uh, to their work on time. We're very, very good at what we do, as well as Fort Belknap, who we uh, do share buses and drivers of, uh, with. We have a contract with them to provide service to them from the Great Falls side. Uh, they do a marvelous job. We also uh, work with Youth Build North Central Montana Transit to expand their program to bring kids who are at youth at uh, risk. Uh, into the youth build program um, and move those kids. We, 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 what we provided for them was an ex they did not have an excuse to say that they couldn't get to school or they couldn't get home from school. We took that away and uh, with great success we've had that, that program did very, very well. Uh, we have a project green build. We, re we took our facility that we have up here, the building that we're in, which was a, a former um, of uh, a garage facility, and uh, we renovated it through uh, works with uh, Montana Peaks uh, to a lead platinum lead quality as far as our energy efficiency. Uh, we do have the building that's, uh, we have a classroom upstairs, um, we have solar, uh, and we're continuing to do remodel on the building as it goes back towards the bus barn where we're at. Also the sharing of the, uh, management of Hill County Airport. Um, if anybody would like to take that position from me, call 406-945-1258. <laughs> it's been quite a learning experience, but uh, um, it is, uh, it's is—it's—it's been a lot of fun. But if anybody wants to learn how to do it, please give me a call. Uh, Boys and Girls Club. We do a lot of work with Boys and Girls Club on summer routes. We had a facility that was here at the Boys and Girls Club that was very, very underutilized in the summer months. Um, and we had a number of kids that uh, needed to have opportunity to get there. Um, so now through the summer months, which is the, our June, July, and August, it's approximately a 62-day period. Uh, we run almost 4,000 kids a year um, to the Boys and Girls Club here in Haver. That was about a, uh, um, it's, it's been a great success uh, for us. As kids could they get on the bus. It's a fixed route schedule. They, are in time for lunch, they're there through the course of the afternoon, and then we take them home. Again, fixed route schedule to the stops, and um, it's wonderful for the parents of children uh, 
They don't have to take time off work. They don't have to find sitters, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's worked very, very well for us. We also do a volunteer garden here um, at the facility. And um, it's been kind of a lot of fun. It's just we grow fresh produce and uh, we provide for the food bank and for also uh, feed, my soup, feed My Sheep Soup Kitchen. So we have a lot of different things that uh, come uh, from North Central Montana Transit. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud about is, and we're going to watch uh, the next uh, video on, it's the biodiesel side. Um, we were instrumental in uh, the use of um, locally produced biodiesel. Uh, it spawned off to where the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Oh, are you there? Oh no! Hello. No, we. I hear you, Jim. You're you're fine. Okay, I'm sorry. I lost. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, oh, there we go. Did you uh, fall off your chair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. No. I, my computer went dead, which is kind of a, yeah, has problems up here with that. But uh, anyway, with the, the use of the uh, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe uh, did a test with the, the use of biodiesel within its uh, switch engines here in the yard. And uh, in severe weather conditions, and then, uh, again, it worked very, very well. Um, through our use and uh, and providing exposure, um, biodiesel now is made available at a local fueling station. Uh, so that, that's pretty cool. You could run a B20 blend, which is, again, a uh, fuel source that's produced right here uh, with crops right here or um, uh, uh, and, and consumed right here uh, through, uh, um, our, through the field use of ESI, our local fueling stations. We also did the technical training for biodiesel uh, to dispel the myths that were out there and um, oil seed, uh, community-based oil seed that provides 10% independence for the oil seed producers and farmers and farming operations. So if we could watch that video, that would be great. Yes, I will cue that up in a minute. Just wanted to, um, a couple of questions for you. Are you responsible for, um, for getting children to elementary schools and middle schools, high schools? We are not. We do not. System? Okay. Yeah, no, there, there. Yeah, there is the bus system. There is the school bus system. Again, they are, they don't operate in the summer months, so that's we we fill that we fill that void. Okay, and then um, one other question before we hear about the biodiesel is how are priorities established? I imagine um, you you were talking about Opportunity Link being the um, kind of the the. Um, uh, the coordinator or of bringing all these different interests together, but once the communities all sit down at the table, how do you prioritize routes? You know, which what well, I will speak specifically what you do for what we did with NCMT. If you look at where the, your demand locations are, um, be it uh, medical, um, education being the, the university, um, in the tribal areas you have the uh, the health services. The, again, the colleges, uh, the, the tribal offices, etc. Um, those are the those are the drivers as far as schools. That's where we see. That's where the most demand was at. So you let the you know once you just once you kind of establish where your demand's at, that almost by de facto uh, defines what your routes are going to be, and um, uh, that's where the majority of our folks are. And the weather report for North Central Montana Transit this morning. It is cold and it is snowing out there. I put on my long woolen underwear, thought about my buffalo robe, but uh, that's not too common these days. Take a vacation today, call in sick, grab your honey, grab a hot toddy and sit around the fireplace because it is not worth going outside. But if you do have to go to work, think about riding the North Central Montana Transit. They service down to Rocky Boy, out to Fort Belknap and back into Haver. It's a nice ride, beautiful buses, beautiful scenery, staring at the Bear Paw Mountains. And, uh, not to mention the, the transit is supporting local economy and agriculture by using Montana grown, produced, and used uh, biodiesel. Technically, biodiesel is a, it's an ester. It's a methyl, ethyl, propyl ester, but um, we won't go there, that's too techy. So. It's a clean, renewable fuel, uh, and when it burns, it smells either like french fries or popcorn, so it's much more enjoyable to uh, smell at your gas pipe. Jim Lyons, of course, the director, 
is um, um, very conscious about the environment, about the, uh, the use of alternative energy. So he approached us if we can uh, um, partner with them and um, use biodiesel in their buses. With our partnership with Montana State Northern University, uh, we were the first ones that started burning biodiesel from the facility. The first one where they produced it for us, we burn it in our, our buses. Um, economically, it's beautiful for us because again, it's uh, we're running B20 in our new buses and that, that equals basically um, a 20% decrease in our fuel cost right now again which is critical but more importantly I think the thing that's wonderful about it when you see a Mon uh, north central Montana bus that's going down the highway and it says running on Montana produced biodiesel uh, people notice that you know it's just very timely there's these buses we have the biodiesel we blend B20 and there you go yeah we're using the public transit system to show that even given our our regions um, extreme climate changes, that it's an effective and efficient fuels to use. We being the first uh, to kind of start bringing it to the forefront, we showing that um, we could run in 42 degrees below zero actual and uh, um, experience no problem with the biodiesel itself. Um, that's really cool. We grow our energy crops locally and we use it locally so we don't depend on the petroleum oil overseas. And in doing so, we are also diversifying the agriculture in the area. We're not saying we stop planting wheat, because we can use this energy crop as a rotational crop with what we are already growing. Um, so when in doing so, you can grow your energy crops locally, produce it locally, and use it locally. So we're becoming more energy independent while providing a good environment to the riders because biodiesel, as we all know, has a better emission than the uh, regular diesel fuel. But it's also good for our regional economy as we encourage farmers to grow pulse crops or oilseed crops that can then be crushed and that oil can be used to create biodiesel that goes in the, the tank of, of these particular buses. And, and so North Central Montana transit system has created a very environmentally responsible way to transport people from point A to point B. But the other thing that they've done by partnering with MSU Northern and local farmers is, is to really create an alternative crop, um, even on a small level, but an alternative crop using uh, primarily at this point Camelina. To, to, to assist the ag economy, which is very, very important to the overall economy of not just our area of Montana, but the, the whole state. Biodiesel has the potential to change the economic landscape for this whole area. That's it for the Roadhouse, signing out. This is TL, you Highliners, have a great day. Well, what we've done here up at North Central Montana Transit, we've done we've done the use of biodiesel. Uh, when, when we got all of our buses up here are, are diesel. We do not run a gas bus. Uh, so everything we have up here is diesel. And we partnered with uh, uh, Montana State Northern University. Okay. Partnered with Montana State Northern University uh, in doing testing uh, with biodiesel for, for the college. Um, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the intent of showing the viability of it up here. Um, you guys probably have heard, or people have probably heard, that you know, in the winter months, et cetera, we have issues with uh, diesel gelling, et cetera. Uh, so what we did is, is we, we took the biodiesel that was produced by Montana State Northern University, ran it on the buses. We run a B20 blend, um, which is 20% uh, basically uh, of your fuel is, uh, is biodiesel. So it's an 80-20 blend. And uh, we ran in our buses through all sorts of conditions. We ran it when it was, again, actual 43 below zero, uh, 105 above. And we experienced not a problem at all with the biodiesel itself. Um, the biodiesel actually did a better job for us uh, in terms of uh, uh, miles per gallon. We got about two mile uh, per gallon increase uh, in our newer buses. 
uh, when we ran the biodiesel side. Older buses, uh, we do have some that have, uh, we use predominantly for in-town, again, the Boys and Girls Club route that have over 500,000 miles on them. Uh, they are all, all DOT inspected, so they are very safe. Uh, but um, uh, the, the older buses, uh, we, we, we thought we were going to experience problems with, but we did not. And through the use of biodiesel, so what, what for QR use, we had signs on the buses that said, run around Montana produced biodiesel. Uh, we had, and people saw that, and that became kind of a very powerful um, message to folks that this is, this is a crop source, that uh, our crop that's growing here, it's harvested here, and then um, it's turned into biodiesel here. So it was a crop source uh, that uh, was right here. The transportation footprint for this product was virtually miles as opposed to hundreds of miles or pipelines, et cetera. Uh, so it worked out very well for uh, people that were producing the, the, uh, the source crops. And again, for the biodiesel producers here, the, uh, where it worked well. And we basically, what we were running with was a 20% uh, reduction in our fuel cost at that time because, again, the fuel that we were testing was through cooperation with Montana State and Northern University. Since that time, a local producer, as he's up here on the High Line, has uh, he has embraced that thought process that if it's grown here, produced here, and consumed here, uh, we, uh, it's good for all parties. It's good for the, uh, for the, for the farmer. It's good for the environment because we all know that it's much more uh, conducive to the, to the environment uh, as far as um, uh, emissions. It smells a lot better when you're burning. Everybody always gets hungry because it smells like French fries, etc. <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're following a bus. Uh, but that, that, that product now is, is produced uh, for and allowed, uh, provided for consumption, again, at the, at the local level. And it's done really, really well. It's taken off. It's done very, very well. Uh, and again, it's something that we, we being Mo uh, North Central Montana Transit, have kind of pushed forward. Uh, it's gone a step further for us now. Um, in the back area, we are now using, uh, we collect uh, waste vegetable oil from the restaurants here in town, uh, spin it out. We do have a centrifuge back here that's, uh, uh, that, we, that we do use. And then uh, the, the clean oil goes over to a, a, a facility in Chester, Montana, where it's turned into biodiesel. And then we want a reduction of cost as far as producing on biodiesel. Cost is very, very important to us, obviously. Um, cost of diesel up here right now is 405 a gallon. So anything that we can do to take that cost down to um, reduce our cost is something we um, obviously are very interested in doing. And again, anytime you can reduce your cost by 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, uh, it's a very, very good thing. Again, no mechanical issues at all uh, have been experienced by us. And to kind of put that in perspective, you know, uh, we run about 400 miles a day on an average. So uh, uh, if you run 400 miles a day, we're a five-day-a-week service, 2,000 miles a week, not experiencing uh, any sort of issues as far as um, use of biodiesel. So that's been a very, very powerful thing for us. Jim, can I interrupt a minute and, and ask why, why there is a myth uh, about the biodiesel gelling at a certain temperature? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, well, all fuel will gel. It's no different than diesel fuel, uh, conventional diesel fuel. Um, what you want to do is, is you know, we, there's, there's an anti-gel that you run in, in, in the uh, uh, system once it gets below a certain ambient temperature. Uh, and we use that with our biodiesel, too, so it didn't coagulate. One of, the, one of the initial things that happens with biodiesel is if you have a, an older diesel engine, one that has not used biodiesel, when you first run biodiesel in it, it has a propensity to clean. It's very, very, it cleans out the system, the fuel system itself. So you'll find people will have fog fuel filters, et cetera. Um, again, we did not have that problem uh, with, with our older buses, again, the ones that are referenced that have the set with many miles on it, uh, because we were gifted those buses from, uh, mountain line in Missoula, Montana, or from Missoula, Montana, and those buses had actually, at points in their career, ran on uh, 
on biodiesel. Uh, so uh, we, we, we've experienced none of the problems uh, with it. And it kind of goes back to when we were talking about earlier, uh, one of the things that we did was provide for uh, uh, training where people could go to the NAT. We had one, we had the National Biodiesel Board uh, Technician Training up here and a very well attended seminar um, by students from Montana State Northern University's diesel um, course uh, uh, that were that attended that, that basically dispelled the myth of biodiesel. And again, by us running it in all these conditions, it's never uh, we're a great we've been a great test bed for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, just remind, uh, uh, yeah, just yeah. remind folks that um, you can go ahead and type your questions into the question pane. Do you want me to go on to the next slide? Please do it. This next slide is uh, basically a shot. It's a snapshot of the funding that we have, the innovation and funding that we have to. We had, and this is 2011, and it continues through 2014, as far as how we fund the system and uh, the sustainability of it. And basically what it comes down to being is, is uh, you have to show value continually um, to the communities that you serve in order, obviously, to keep the funding sources available to keep the system up. Uh, we are state-funded. Uh, we do receive operation assistance from the state. Um, it, you can see that we have the operation of the system in um, 2011 to 17,000, and then the job access and re reverse commute, which is no longer available, uh, 50,000. But we do work very, very much so with the, the university up here, Montana State Northern University, as far as moving students to and from uh, the college. Uh, we have numerous stops for the course today up there, bringing people in from the reservation systems uh, and taking people out to the colleges at the reservation system at the reservation, um, and we also um, uh, do have an in-town route that we provide uh, for the students in Montana State or the University to get to and from stores, etc. cetera. Um, Hill County, Blaine County, those are the two counties that we've run through. Uh, they do continue to provide for operating assistance as far as it goes, and also for Belknap community. But basically what it is is, it, you know, if you look at all those we have to continue to show our viability and we have to show how uh, we can't, we, we have to show the value in public transportation to be at Mulhook Clinic. Uh, we are a fare based system now. We charge one dollar um, to go to and from, as an example, Haver to uh, Fort Belknap. It's a 45 mile trip. Uh, so if you write us out, it's cost you a dollar, and if you come back in, it costs you a dollar. So if we're a, approximately a 90 to 100 mile trip, uh, it costs two dollars. It's a ten dollar fare to and from Great Falls, um, which uh, are two Great Falls, twenty dollar round trip. So we're very, very cost effective as uh, you can as you as you can imagine. Um, our ridership uh, is approximately 80 a day. Um, we run about 22,000, 21 to 22,000 provided uh, rides per year. And uh, we are anticipating hopefully a 5% growth this year in uh, the number of rides that we provide. But again, on the funding side, um, keep going back to the fact that um, what's important is to show value to the communities and to the entities that uh, we do serve. Any questions? Um, one other question, a couple other questions. Um, do you know of any rural, other rural transit systems around the country? Is this, do you uh, feel like this is a unique system? From a funding standpoint, I think we're unique. Um, we are, what you find is most of the funding system, or most of the systems are um, through mill levy, through, um, uh, from a tax base. Um, we are not. Uh, one of the reasons we have a difficult time doing that is because we are multi-county, and although we we say that you know we show that we are we're Blaine County and Hill County, uh, we're, we're multi-county. We're run through multi-reservations. We actually go uh, through a number of other counties on our trip to Great Falls, uh, which is a 150, 120-mile one-way trip. 
Um, so we do have many candidates that we run through. So it's difficult for us, or it's been difficult for us to go after anything uh, in terms of mill levy, et cetera, because again, we travel such a large area and uh, through very, you know, through, um, uh, again, multiple counties and multiple reservations. Okay, and just one more question. Um, if you had a, do, do you have any recommendations of first steps for communities who might want to establish a rural transit system? Well, I think the approach that the opportunity look, link took was the, the, the was the, the right approach, or is the right approach, um, and that is, is obviously to get, you know, depending on the width and breadth of the transportation system, you have to get the players involved. You have to get the local government. You have to get the um, uh, from the mayors to the city councils to the county commissioners uh, to the players within the community. And uh, as an example, you know the uh, the, the the colleges, etc. You have to get everybody at the table, and I, I think the approach that they took was, or that we and we continue to take, uh, is, is proven itself out through the number of um, uh, systems that have been started uh, by OL bringing everybody to the table, and again being that neutral conveyor, um, and the fact that these systems are continuing, they're sustainable, uh, they're continuing to grow. Um, and um, they'll they'll be there for a very very long time. Uh, and the reason that they're there is because again they have, they have the right people at the table. So step number one is is to get to get the people and the the entities involved that are going to be there long term and those that you're you know you're going to be really serving the the population basis that you're going to be serving taking people to and from. Um, very very important. I, I know that's just, it sounds like it's, it's a very simple thing, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to get everybody to the table, but once you do, it's, uh, it's, it takes on a life of its own. Great. Well, thank you. That is all the questions I have. I just want to remind, or just want to let everybody know that I, I apologize for the biodiesel video not working, and I will um, make sure I send that link. It, I, I make sure we get it posted on our Greening Local Government website, but also I will send that link out to um, you folks who are on the line. And um, I think that's all the questions I have, Jim. So thank you. I just applaud the work that you guys have all done up there on the High Line. So thank you very much for sharing you that with us. You bet, Smiley. And just as, as information, too, um, if you go to the Opportunity Link webpage uh, and go under uh, the, the new items, uh, there is a, there's a series of four of videos. So you could look at uh, all four if you're so inclined. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going to turn it to the last slide because that has um, the contact information on there. Here we go. So on this slide, we see we read the line is the five-part web series of videos. You can find that at opportunitylinkmontana.org, and um, there are the, there's the contact information. Thank you, Day. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, attendees, and. We look forward to the next time. Thanks.